Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome. August 24, 2022. It's going to be a good day. You know why? Because we got Steve Edwards here to talk about mules and donkeys, and there's no way it's going to be a bad day when that's the case. Steve, how are things out there on the ranch today? Oh, by golly, is we got sunshine and semi clouds, and it ain't bad out there. I think it's around 90 degrees. Pretty nice. It's just, it's cool that this has been a relatively cool August. I've lived here my entire life, and you've lived here for several decades, and I cannot remember an August in recent memory that has been this cool. Usually, it's uh, 110 multiple days, but it seems like we've even gotten a couple that have been in uh, dual digits. I'll take it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You betcha. That's right. Hey, you know where I was uh, over the weekend, Steve? Uh, I can see your backyard right there. Uh, all that <laughs> snow with it. That's right. I, uh, I spent uh, I spent time last week in um, uh, Montana. I spent time last week in Montana and uh, Glacier National uh, Park. It was so much fun. It was a blast. We did hikes. We did kayaking. I never thought I'd be in a kayak in my entire life. And I found myself in a kayak. So that was a blast. And uh, it got me thinking uh, just how amazing Montana is. And I figured, you know what? Uh, Montana. We've got something coming up in Montana. What is it that we have coming up? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to be in Superior, Montana, Labor Day weekend, um, a Saturday and a Sunday and a part of time Monday doing a clinic. And um, uh, it's not just a matter of doing a clinic. I'm going to go up there and see a very, very good friend, Ron Dim. And he's actually purchased my uh, my uh, breaking wagon that I got. I had a wagon with a Chevy truck undercarriage, sixty three Chevy truck undercarriage, and uh, it was my it was my wagon I used to train mules on to train to a wagon. Uh, hydraulic brakes, coil springs, suspension. Boy, it was a dandy and heavy duty, really stout, and uh, and harness for a six up and all kinds of collars and things like that. And uh, Ron told me he, he wanted it all. His daughter came and did some training with me several years ago as well. But anyway, I've known Ron a lot of years and uh, his, he's got his ranch up there in Montana. We're gonna go up there, deliver the wagon, at the same time do a clinic and then turn around and head back home. So we're driving up and driving down. Driving up, driving down. We're going to drive this show straight forward into your living room or wherever you're watching from, uh, answering questions about mules and donkeys. If this is your first time ever hanging out with us, we do want to say thank you. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, we know that you could be spending a lot of time doing a lot of different things. Um, you know, when I was a kid, one of the hardest things for me to part with was my money, but I'd give away my time all day long. And now as I've got older, it's easier for me to part with my money and I'm holding on to my time. I'm keeping my time close to my chest because I can always figure out a way to make more money. I cannot figure out a way to make more time. So the fact that you're spending a little bit of that capital with us today and uh, invest in some of your time, it really does mean a lot to us and we're grateful. The first thing that we ask is um, that you just let us know that you are here. Put your name where you're watching from and what the weather is like in the comment section below. Uh, we want to say hi. We want to uh, let you know that we see you and we want to know that you see us. Uh, gosh, uh, if there's some sort of an issue and y'all ain't able to see us, we're just going to be talking to ourselves and that ain't going to be no fun. So let us know that you can see us and uh, that way we can see you. So uh, name where you're watching from, what the weather's like. The second thing we ask is that you help us with the content for this program. What does that mean? Well, Quite simply, just ask questions. That's all you've got to do. Um, there's really not a whole lot worse than investing a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of effort into bringing one of your dreams to life. And at the end of every session you've got out there in the round pen or in the arena or in the dirt, uh, to come back in and just feel like, hey, this ain't worth it. Um, we want to help you avoid that as much as possible. We want you to go inside and say, oh my gosh, I got to send a picture to my friends and show them what my mule did today. So ask questions so that you get the answers you need to go back out there and have someone film you doing the things you've been practicing. And then one day when you got that ground foundation done, you can hop up in the saddle and enjoy that ride or you can get behind the reins and you can enjoy driving or you can pack it up and lead that animal. 
Uh, but do yourself a favor, ask the question because we don't want you to quit. We want you to, uh, we want you to get the reward that comes at the end of all of that hard work. And then the third thing that we ask is you share the broadcast. And it's easy to do that. If you're on YouTube, you click the like button and then the share button. And when you click uh, the subscribe button, just make sure to turn on notifications. That way you get a heads up anytime we go live or we release a new video. So that's how you do it on YouTube. If you're on Facebook, you click the like button, click that share button, or you can just tag a friend or family member in the comment section, just like you would on any other post on Facebook. And so that's really all that we ask those three things, name where you're watching from, what the weather's like Two: ask any and every mule or donkey question you got. And number three, share the broadcast. With that in mind, we want to say hello to Cowboy Ken coming to us from Connecticut where it's 83 degrees and sunny. Polly is hanging out with us at in Barnesville, Minnesota where it's 77 degrees and beautiful. It looks like rain is coming. Barbara is watching from Sullivan, Missouri, partly cloudy and in the upper 80s. Linda, the mule servant, and Theo, the one-eyed mule, are reporting from... Rural Central Ohio, Pleasant Central Ohio. She says, so sad we can't come to Montana this time. There is Tennessee, and then we'll try and come up with a next time. But it's good to hear from you, Linda. We're glad that you're here, and I know Theo appreciates you being here. He wants you to get your education, young lady. Randy is watching uh, from uh, Mountain Home, Arkansas, 84 degrees, and uh, I would take that all day long. Stacy's watching from Colorado. Beautiful 85 degrees and sunny. Safe travels for your Montana clinic. You'll take that, right, Steve? Absolutely. Send those oh, prayers, y'all. Uh, let's see here. Hey, Mr. Coffee himself, David Pengelly, he says, raining. Perfect bourbon weather. <laughs> That's a man right there. All right. Good to have you here, Mr. Coffee. Uh, Linda says, if you want to send me the money, Dave, I'll send you my PayPal address. Oh man, do you know how badly I wish? Uh, I was in Montana uh, with my friends and one of my friends paid for everything. He said, just get yourself there and I'll pay for everything. Uh, he did that for Wyoming and he did this for Montana and it was a lot of fun. And I've talked to Sondra, this place that we went to in Montana was just, the everything was stunning about it. And the uh, lodging that they had us in, it was a four level like lodge type thing, probably slept about 30 people, but it wasn't like everybody's crammed in like hostel style. It was like hotel style. Like there was almost a bathroom for every bedroom. There were these two big bunkhouse areas that would have been perfect for kids. And I told my wife, I said, one thing I would love to do is rent out one of these places and then just say to my family, Hey, y'all get yourself here and we'll take everything else. That would be that would be a lot of fun. So uh, one day, Linda, I'm hoping one day. Laura is watching from Tennessee with warm weather, but not as humid today, which we all know that means good. And does anybody out there actually like humidity? Put it in the comments section. If you just love humidity and you love your hair just falling down flat, um, it's great for the skin, but it's really bad if you've got the electrical shock hair like I do. Kathy is watching. Uh, Sunjun uh, pronounced uh, Sage, Sajun, there we go, Sajun Miller. Sa thank you for that, Sajun. South Carolina, overcast and humid. Uh, Miss Backwoods, Northern Maine, 73. Vicky is watching from Queen Creek. Rip is here. Big old mule uh, has taken up cribbing. Is this a suggestion from my 1,000 pound termite? What is that, Steve? Mule cribbing, 100 pound termite. You and Rip speaking in riddles? Yeah, well, cowboys are known to. To, to talk a little different, that's for sure. That's why I'm going to apply to the United States government because you see, I only speak cowboy and you know, they want you to speak uh, this good ling language, language, you know, uh, and folks, some folks, they get money for Ebonics. So I'm going to get money for being cowboy. But anyway, he said cribbing. Now cribbing can be several things number one folks look if your corrals are made out of wood consider them to be toothpicks if you have a tree in your corral consider it to be a toothpick they will chew because they enjoy chewing their teeth erupt and as they chew 
It makes the teeth feel better. Yes, it does. Now, uh, number one thing, uh, Rip, I, I'm going to tell you, partner, uh, that's why all of my corrals are metal. Now, if you can have a cribber, but it's also called a windsucker. So if they take their front teeth and they bite onto a metal corral and they pull back, suck back, that is called a windsucker. And that's not good. Those far as, yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it gives bad habits to the other animals as well. And it's a lot of time, times due to boredom. But let's go back. If all he's doing is chewing wood, just get you some metal corrals. That's the best way. Now, you don't want to get rid of the wood corrals. I take all of my diesel uh, oil and I pour it across the top of that wood. And uh, that helps them from not chewing on the wood. But I'm going to tell you, even if it's a barn and it's flat plywood on the inside, they'll chew a hole clear through that sucker. It's just that that's what they like to do. They like to chew. And so when it comes to wood, they'll chew it. All right. Hopping back over here. Uh, glad to know that y'all uh, y'all are talking cowboy. I'm going to take notes and we'll, we'll see if... Uh, We'll see if I can't there then there understand some of that there then cowboy talky talk. Yep. Out of way. There you are. Just right. <laughs> My kids would be so proud. Wayne is watching. Evening, y'all. Still hot and humid here in Georgia, but a little cloudy. Question. What are your thoughts on hauling mules in a cattle trailer? Should they be tied? If yes, what direction? Some say forward. Others suggest backwards or to the side. Others say don't tie them at all. What would you say to Wayne? Well, you know, I there's there's several ways to tie them, and I mean putting them in a trailer. Yes, you can tie them head in the in the one the first one the head forward, second one the head backward. That way you even the weight on your trailer right and left. Because here's the problem: when you put all your mules on one side, in other words, they're all looking to the left and all of their weight from the center forward is off their shoulders and their neck, then you've got all the weight to one side. So if you want to even the weight, you do butt to tail. Now, if around the ranch, if we're just, uh, we're going to go uh, 15, 20 miles, we hardly ever bother tying them. We just take the bridle and we put it on the horn and tie that off and uh, and just let them uh, ride, they usually turn around and look the way they're coming. They're a lot happier that way. You'll find them even pawing less in the trailer if they're able just to look out the back. Now, if it's all enclosed trailer, then that's going to be a little bit different story, you know. But in my stock trailer, my cattle trailer, um, it uh, I, I hardly ever tie them. Now, I can tell you I've also gone to Montana with my mules, clear to Montana, where I'm going this week, this weekend. And I hauled them clear to Montana and never took them out of the trailer. It's too much trouble taking them in and out of the trailer, folks. You can get yourself in a bunch of trouble thinking you want to stretch your mule. Don't do it. I can tell you some horror stories, but here's the deal. I put two mules in there. I saddled them and uh, loosely saddled them. And I uh, turned them loose. And the, both of them turned around, all three of them, matter of fact, turned around and looked out the other way. And that's why they went all the way to Montana. We stopped in Utah uh, for an overnight, just left them in a trailer. I pulled the saddles and stuff off of them, took them saddles in, inside the uh, hotel room. And then the next morning, we saddled them back up. We watered them again because you see they had water and they had feed inside that trailer that night. The next morning, I took the water and feed away because I don't want them choking as they're going down the road. But uh, I, I can tell you, uh, I, we rarely tied when we're going long distance. All right. Keep moving on here. We've got Cinda watching from Groton, New York, 83 degrees. Happy to say I will be in Tennessee the same time Steve is there. Looking forward to listening to Steve's presentation. So folks, what are we talking about here? Well, what we're talking about is Steve does have the mule 
Clinic, Mule and Donkey Clinic happening in Montana, but he also has an event happening in Tennessee. Now, it's not his event. This is the um, this is the uh, American Mule and Bluegrass Music Festival, and it's going to be in Shelbyville, Tennessee. It's going to be begin end of September, beginning of October, and it will be a lot of fun. I'm going to put a link in the comment section here. Y'all can learn all about it. Um, Steve is not selling tickets for this. We've got it on the site, so if people are looking for it, they can find it. But you get your tickets directly from the festival website themselves. So you can go check it out. I'm going to type it at American Mule and Bluegrass Festival. And uh, you go check it out there. Steve will be presenting on, um, I think it's uh, Friday and Saturday, and he'll be at, in attendance on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so don't don't um, kind of like tenderfoot around him. If you see him, go up, say hello. If you want to grab a picture, just say you want to get a picture. Um, he's there to, to meet y'all. He's there to see y'all. He's there to hang out and to enjoy some time out there. So if you see him and you want to say hello, say hello. We appreciate, you know, trying to, you know, res respect and everything like that. But he's there for he's there for you guys. And if he wasn't, then he is now because he's not going to go back on that. Uh, let's see here. Now we've uh, let's see. We've got Linda says, Dave, that place you describe sounds like the old faithful inn. All right. I'm going to take my family to the old faithful inn because I love the place I was describing. Lamar is watching from Price, Utah, where it's 93. Karen says, happy to see you all again. Beautiful weather here in Virginia. I have a couple questions about packing. Well, you know, Samsonite suitcases are great. You can go on to Amazon. You can find some great suitcases there. I recommend that you take your, oh, not that type of packing. Okay, we're kind of new at it. How long do you like your lead rope to be? Is it okay for the pack mule to travel with her nose at my leg if the trail is wide enough? Or should she be completely behind my riding mule? Now, I would imagine there's some video, uh, some of the video of your uh, uh how to pack series, Steve, would be helpful. But what would you say here to uh, Karen? You know, Karen, it really depends on on your your trail as you're going. Uh, I like to make sure I can look over my right shoulder and just back behind me, sometimes at my leg, sometimes at my mule's tail, and sometimes three foot behind that. So it just really depends. You also want to, be, your riding animal needs to be very good about having a rope bounce around their butt and having an animal close. But I usually keep about uh, about a 12 foot rope with me and I use my come along hitch. Matter of fact, uh, with my lead mule, my, um, with my mule, uh, the first mule is usually my mule with least experience and I'm training on him. So sometimes I'll bring him up, sometimes I'll let him be back but I have the come along rope on him so that I can line him out. Then my next two, three mules uh, are going to be my swing mules. And they're usually pretty well trained in the halter and real good that way. And then my very back mule is uh, that's my whip mule. And, uh, and they, again, folks, they're well trained in the halter. That's, a, it's important. Good, solid halter foundation with the come along hitch. So it just really depends on the terrain. Now, I can also tell you that when we're in switchbacks, where it goes back and forth across the top side of a mountain, uh, I'll take all of my mules loose, all the halters loose, because you don't want them to have them hung up on the halter. I've seen a lot of wrecks with them rolling down the side of a mountain because they were, they were all uh, tied together. So we usually take them loose, have the guy in the back do the hazing. He keeps the mules tight and compact going up and they can go up the switchbacks without any problem. So there's something to consider when you're doing several animals. All right. So before this weekend, I did not know what switchback meant. I know what switchback means now. I saw that switchback and I was like, man, I don't think my knees are going to make it. So I turned it back around and uh, all my friends went, they thought it was great. Sonner and I walked back and, uh, we enjoyed ourselves, and I enjoyed the ability to walk thereafter. Uh, hopping back over into Facebook and YouTube, we've got um, uh, Linda says, Cribbing is awful. If the critter gets good at it, they can stand out in the open and suck 
air even without a piece of wood to brace on. So there you go. Yeah. If they're a wind sucker, they'll do that. But just cribbing, just chewing wood, that's different. But you bet. I, I'll be honest with you, folks. I just soon put one down because it's a horrible habit. They become in, they become infatuated with it, and you just can't get it. It's it's a horrible riding animal. Uh, Steve is watching from Delta, Colorado, ninety degrees, hot and sunny. Uh, Linda says maybe I can get to Tennessee. That should be a song. Maybe I can get to Tennessee where you will love me. Da, da. Something <laughs> like that. Uh, keep your day job. Hey, hello from Ontario, Canada. That deserves a glockenspiel. This is Morgan. Says absolutely love listening to you guys. First time I've been able to catch you guys live. Hey. <laughs> Good to have you here, Morgan. We're so glad you're hanging out with us. Uh, my, how many people did that just freak out? And they're looking outside Ooh. wondering what's going on. Myra's watching from warm, dry Southern California. I always hear something each week that turns on the light bulb and helps me to fill in my mule training puzzle. Thanks. All right. Next question we've got. Uh, this one comes from Jane. She says, Steve, I've got a question for you. Do you know if anyone who breeds hypoallergenic mules, I have severe uh, allergic asthma and going to visit my curly ho horse farm to get tested with their horses. Uh, I have done this over the years and even though some seem less of a problem for me, I've not found a horse with a suitable temperament or training. Well, I, I, I got a couple stories to tell you. Number one, I have asthma and uh, I can tell you that being around mules all these years have been fine. I've had asthma. It's one of the reasons we moved to Arizona in 1956 because of my asthma. We moved from Tennessee to uh, Arizona in 1956. And I've had virtually no problem being here in Arizona. But I can also tell you a little story. Up at Friendly Pines Camp in Prescott, Arizona, uh, I was uh, the head wrangler up there. They called me Cowboy. And... Um, I would, I, I wrangled the mules. I mainly kept track of the mules and Mr. Ray Gardner, he took care of the horses. And uh, I did the stage coaches and I did the wagons. And I did the pack strings and we did call the mule brigade, we called it. And the mules were pretty awesome. Now, Mr. Gardner's grandson was allergic to horses. Couldn't get around them, sneezed and broke and this sort of thing. But I had him get up in the wagon with me to go for a ride. I didn't know he was allergic to animals at that time. And we went all around. I had him drive the mules and he just had a ball. And he got back to his grandpa, uh, Ray Gardner. And he said, Grandpa, he said, look, I'm not sneezing. I'm not breaking out, nothing. He says, we got to get rid of these horses and just have mules because they're much more better. <laughs> and boy, Ray Gardner, he just... He shook his head. He said, darn you, cowboy, you're trying to get into my grandkids head, you know, with them mules. That's very good. Uh, let's see here. Bangor is here. My new Molly mule won't accept her new rope halter that I got from Steve. Instead, she pulls her head back and spins around. Now, Bangor, that is the first time we've ever heard that happen. I think we might just, I think we might just have to throw in the towel. Steve, what do you think? Number one, number one, number one, it's your timing. And everybody's heard me say this. It ain't the rope halter. It is your timing. If the nose goes, the mule goes. If the right ear goes, they're going to go to the right. If the left ear goes left, it's they're going to the left. Now, do not depend upon the halter. You all have told me, you've heard me tell you this. For years, the halter is not completely for training. It does not help you do the foundational training. Now, I know there's one video series that Dave did last week, and it showed a picture of a lady, and Dave, we need to work on this, and she was working with the halter, and I was showing her how to back up and turn right left with the halter. But understand, folks, I used the come along hitch first. I built a foundation first with the come along hitch. Now, the other thing is, send me a picture 
of your halter adjusted on the mule. That's the other thing. But let's go back. Take your halters, folks, all of you. Take your halters and hang them on a nail. Leave them there, okay? When you go to get your mule from the corral to where you saddle up, that's a training area. It keeps keeping your mule straight. Don't allow them to look to the right. Don't allow them to look to the left. It's just like you going down the trail. Going down the trail, you want them to be going straight. If they look to the right, guess what they're going to do? They're looking for monsters. Yes, they're the bottom of the food chain, folks. You've heard me tell you and tell you and tell you about that. Okay, you've got to think about they are only allowed to be straight. Now, let's test this. Let's test this theory. I want you to get in your car, get out on the road and let go of the steering wheel and see which way your car goes. Yeah, it's going to go to the right or left depending on the crown of the road. You must not allow your mule to look around. So from A to B, from the corral to where you saddle up, Make them be straight. Now, once you get there, if you got your foundation right, if you got your foundation right, you throw the lead rope on the ground, they'll stand there, and you groom them, you saddle them, you ride off. Listen, in Arizona, we got nothing to tie to. We get stuck out there in the middle of nowhere. On a, there's no, you can't tie to a choy cactus, can you, Dave? No. Okay, that's why I have them. You can grounded. try, but you won't be trying again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One rain, when I say ground tie, when you got your bridle on, one rain goes on the horn, the other rain goes on the ground. That's called ground tie. Now, let me ask you something. On any of these old westerns, I want you to watch. When they come riding off and get off, do they take their bridle off and put their halter on and tie the mule? No. To tie the horse? No, they don't. The animal is so well halter trained, they respect the slightest, tiniest tug upon their mouth. And it's even better with the come along hitch. Now, Dave, when we go to uh, Montana, and I know we got a bunch of other videos someplace around there we can show people, like me picking up the back foot on that mule. You know, uh, that's just one of them. And another one, you know, you can, that's every single clinic I teach everybody, this is ground tight. This is ground tight. Don't rely on a halter. Them nylon halters, Dave, I, I'll never forget. I come from town one day and old Bill Doherty sees me with a bunch of halters, nylon halters. He said, what are you going to do with them? I said, I'm not tying no more rope halters. I'm just going to use the nylon halters and just buckle them up and I'm done. He says, Steve, they ain't going to do nothing but cause you problems. And he was right. We started training and they would pull back and they would fall over backwards. They'd break the halters. They'd break the snap, fall over backwards. And back then we didn't think nothing about it. Now I'd say take them to a chiropractor. But anyway, we started having people bringing us horses that were halter pullers. And so there was a lot of ways that we fixed halter pullers. Don't hardly hear about it now, but one of the demonstrations that that you see in some of my videos is a halter in that same video i think you showed last week there dave uh, of a nylon halter and i was talking about look what it's doing to the cheekbone or look how it's teaching the mule to brace folks always when you're pointing toward that mule and saying you're a problem look i have three more pointing back toward me i am the problem my timing is what's important, okay? My timing. That's why I tell you, too, with your, your mules and your donkeys, you know, when you tighten up your cinches, you tighten them up easy so you don't teach them to blow up. All these animals have got these bad problems because of me. Yeah, this me is you. So your timing. Start with the come along hitch first, folks. And Dave, you and I will talk about this after the show's over with, because a lot of folks don't realize, uh, you know, when they buy when they when they buy the uh, the come along, I mean the the rope, yeah, halter, 
they think that's going to fix their problems. It is not. Matter of fact, it can even make the problems bigger. Start with the come along hitch. Buy that, that ground communication kit. It's got a video how to do it. And that way you can do it right. And, and then, uh, like I said, Dave, we need to do something like on that one video series you did last week that says in there, we started out with the come along hitch first. Because when folks see that video, they think that, oh, the halter did a job. No, uh, folks, the, the, the come along hitch first, then the halter. Yeah. And our fault, we got it. Well, that that's that's one of the things that's actually pretty refreshing. Folks, if you've yes. been watching, if you're like Eileen, Eileen has been here since video one, since live stream day one, I think. And so Eileen, wow. uh, Eileen may have picked up on this, but Steve is not dogmatic about the way he trains. He's always learning new things. So he's not going to dig his heels and say, well, this is the way I trained in 92. So this is the way I trained in 20." 22. Um, Steve continues to learn new things. And if you watch these shows long enough, you'll hear something like this. I'll say, so what, what do you have to say, Steve? And Steve will say, well, I don't know that I've ever heard of anything like that. I sure would be interested to find out. And if you learn anything, come back and tell me, because I'd love to be able to know what to do about that as well. And so if you take this rope halter deal, yes, about 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, uh, there was a lot of work that we were doing with the rope halter, more so than today. Today, we do virtually no work with the rope halter. Why? Because over time, Steve found more and more that he was leaning on the come-along rope and getting the results with the come-along rope, whereas the rope halter, it was taking more time and effort, and the impact was much greater and much quicker with the come-along rope. So what do we do? Do we just keep saying you need to have the rope halter and try to sell more product and, and not you know, change it up. No, you'll hear us say it. Hey, we want you to get the ground foundation starting kit because there are instances where you'll want the halter, uh, i.e. sir single training. You'll want to have a rope halter for sir single training. That'll teach the animal to keep his head on the, or his nose on the vertical and frame himself up. You're going to need that there. But if you're doing any of this corrective work, if you're doing any of this ground work, you're going to want the come along rope because it puts you in the best position to communicate as quickly as possible. And Steve's not yeah. dogmatic and is not going to you know, keep saying the same thing just because that's what he's always said. Uh, you'll probably in the next 10, 12 months, you'll hear Steve change his tune on something and say, hey, I've learned this and here's how I'm doing it now and the results I'm getting are much better. So folks who watch know that. And uh, we're, we're, we're not too uh, prideful to, to, to change things up when we find a better way of doing it. Heck, that's how we got to where we are today, uh, being right. able to help folks so all Dave, over the world. Yeah. One of the things that I've always concerned about when I was teaching about the come along hitch was how people would do, they would make mistakes with it. And the come along hitch then would create more problems. So, for instance, they would tie the mule up with a come along hitch. And, and at that time, I would, I would just kind of mention, you never want to tie hard and fast, but now I really focus on that. You know, uh, I, I was always hesitant because I was worried people were going to get hurt with it. In all actuality, it's the far superior tool when it comes down to training. We always, uh, you know, using the rope halters, we did use them a lot, but also we just put a loop over the mule's neck or the horse's neck and let them, you know, because they were so well halter uh, foundation. So uh, yeah, Dave, that's, you're exactly right. I, I, uh, I always want to do everybody better. And if I get a chance to help you, I want to do it. All right here. Um, we've got, I got to scroll back up here. Um, Oh man, there's been a lot of folks who have come in since I've scrolled down here. Okay. Uh, Craig is watching from El Reno, Oklahoma, 90 degrees, partly cloudy, cloudy. Tanya is watching from Penrose, beautiful sunny day. So happy to catch you guys live. It's great to be caught live. Uh, Fiona, I would rather be caught live than dead. Fiona says, uh, hello from Southwest Victoria. Here we go. Sunny and 14 degrees Celsius, refining my long reigning with my mule for competition at Geelong Royal Show in October. 
have you on as a speaker so I can listen. Hey, we're right there. If you want us to sing a song, let me know. I'll make Steve sing. Uh, Bangor says, uh, so I just purchased her and she is 12 and skittish. She lets me put on her nylon halter that she came with, but is super freaked out by the rope halter. So should I just move on to the come along? And let me take this one, Steve. Yes. Yes. Just move on to the come along, right? Yep. There you Absolutely. go. Absolutely. That come along rope is going to give you, and and I'm just going out on a limb here, Steve. Correct me if I'm wrong. That come along rope, it's going to be essential for your timing that you correct right away so the animal develops a respect for no matter what you put on. So if you are working with them, you've got that come along rope and you go to put on the rope. Can you put the rope halter on over the come along rope if you're trying to work on that, Steve? Would that be something you could do? Well, you're better off having the come along on rope first. And then, yes, you could put the halter on second. But, it, you know, when you put a halter on or even the come along, the idea is to get them to drop their head and tip their nose to the left, which we got some video out on that. So uh, anytime somebody has a problem and the mule doesn't work flawlessly or the donkey doesn't work flawlessly, they think it's the IE tool the come along or the rope halter when in all essence it is your timing you may not even need to put that halter on right there first you need to get them to drop their head and tip their nose to the left which we got some video on that don't we dave about dropping their head you know uh and that's really important folks that you do that before the halter get them to understand you'll see in the video they drop their head keep their nose to the left and that last clinic we did here at the ranch uh, I demonstrated that. Do that first before you put a come along rope on, a bridle on, a halter on. Get them to drop their head, keep the nose left. Watch the video and you'll see it. That mule will not want to move because of this. Mules, you train from their nose. So they don't want you to put their hand on the nose because it makes them uncomfortable. Okay? Because folks, a lot of folks are heavy. And so when you, when you learn to put your hand on, take it off, put your hand on, take it off, then they'll tip their head to the left and they'll keep it right there because what they don't want to do is have you put your hand on their nose because it's heavy and a lot of people pull on them. All right. Let's see here. Moving right along. Um, Susan Callahan says, Steve, do you have a good mule farrier that you recommend? I will travel. My farrier is MIA and we are at 13 weeks. Need shoes all the way around for one mule and a trim on the second mule. Now, let me tell you something real quick. If you want, if you're messaging someone, I'm not saying this is the farrier, but if you're sending an email to someone and they're not responding, or if you're sending a text message to someone, you just send them the message, say, uh, hey, Steve, just wanted to check and see if you've fallen and can't get up. Please let me know so I can send help. 100% of the time, folks have responded to me when I send that message. Okay, do you have a good farrier you can recommend, Steve? Yes, I do. And um, I'm, uh, I'm going to give you his name right now. Uh, his name is Sean. Now, get this last name. To Cook. Now, I call it T-O-C-O-O-K. Now, I don't know if that's the right spelling. Sean to cook. And he's been taking care of my clients here. I know he does go up north. I don't think he goes to Kingman, Susan, but but Sean does a just a great job. He's very careful. He's consistent. I've worked with him a lot. He does a great job. Phone number 480-580-6000. 480-580-6041. Now, let me tell you, folks, the farrier business is worldwide epidemic. Yeah, listen. <laughs> we, we've got a very good friend in, is it Denmark? Um uh, where is she from? It could be she, Denmark. She, it's I, I lost. Could it, it be right Dallas? No, no. But anyway, she had she actually got her mule crippled 
by this vet and this this farrier and done a bad job uh oh she's always uh we haven't heard from her for a bit because her country is kind of upside netherlands the netherlands and uh anyway she's having horrible problems and she's end up doing a lot of it herself but but uh anyway it's it, it's it's the way it is folks uh it's it's horrible that people don't get back to you um uh, uh, I understand that. I I'm trying to do my best to get to everyone and visit with you and try to give you time so that you understand what's going on. And I want to help you. You know, I've got one guy that uh, Steve, uh, Steve is his name. It's a good name. Uh, he just emailed me and says, Steve, uh, I don't think this saddle's working out. It makes me feel forward in the saddle. I feel forward. Well, folks, it could be lots of things. Lots of things. Number one thing your mule's confirmation is downhill hip pad so the hip is high and it makes the saddle run downhill that's confirmation of your mule and we've got a bunch of information on that here's the next thing if you if you don't have your 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 feet in the stirrups and the fenders correctly heels down toes up now you've heard me talk about this before just stand on flat ground and lift up your heels, you're going to feel forward. If you lift up your toes, you're going to feel backwards. Seems natural, okay? So think about how you present yourself in the saddle. The other thing is, I've had people have their saddles too far back, and then that made them go forward. So, hey, I'm here to help you. Don't, don't ever feel that I'm not going to try to find some way to help you. I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm basically retired, right? Uh, yeah, but I still help a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, I enjoy it. It's fun. Now, the one that the Tennessee clinic that I'm doing, that clinic is, I'm not charging anything for it. Listen, folks, the money that you put in to ad, uh, admission into that show all goes to veterans. And that's why I'm going. I'm paying my own way even to go, okay? Because I want to go there and help. So please come. Uh, you know, if you want to come and ask me questions, if I'm going to be doing some demonstrations, I'm not going to be bringing saddles and stuff there. I'm not there to sell stuff. I am there to support this great, really great program. This is the second year and I want to see it go. So that's what we're all about, huh, Dave? Awesome. Even, yeah, even absolutely. Fall asleep on me. Yeah, no, no, I'm here. I'm, I'm here. I'll be all right. Uh, we've got, okay. So here we go. I'm going to give the initials. BD is watching from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, 55 degrees at work. Don't tell anybody. So we're using initials here, aliases. Says, I'm headed to the Montana clinic. Going to be very fun. First ever clinic and a new mule owner. Hey, that gets a glockenspiel. That will be awesome to have you there, BD. I know you're going to love it. Jack is watching from Johannesburg, 75 degrees, and Drizzle, finally. Is that a little two-step dance move you do, Jack, called the Drizzle? Everybody do the Drizzle. Uh, let's see. Linda says, Linda and Susan are talking back and forth to one another. That's always fun to see. Uh, Linda says, Steve, is it okay to tie briefly with the come-along rope? I do that with Theo when I'm trying to adjust tack and saddle. If, if Theo is standing there nice and quiet and doesn't pull back, you bet. You can dally even on your horn. That's a form of time. And I can tell you, Dave and I can tell you, because one time I, we did a video on, 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 uh, on uh, trailer loading, and I only had one hand because the other one I'd cut with my knife. And so I, I basically had one hand I was trying to work with. But did I use the trailer to dally with? Yes. Okay. Did I have the mule hit the back of it and really hit him hard? Yes. But you know what? After that, he started loading. So yes, it's okay. I just don't want you to, to tie and think he's good. And when he pulls back, it can really put the hurt on him. So, and most folks don't tie a knot correctly anyway. Oh, by the way, um, you might mention the BD. I hope he understands that folks you got to have a ticket yeah. to go to this clinic don't just show up 
expecting to go to the clinic because you won't be able to do it. Y'all get into rent. y'all get yourself into Montana wondering where the address is and you ain't gonna have it because it only goes to people who are on the receipt list there. That, that's right, exactly. And I have some people that say they're just gonna go to Superior and try to find it. Well, good luck on that one because here's the deal. This ranch sits way back in the middle of nowhere and the roads are are gated and locked. So uh, I, I'm, and I'm not trying to be mean, folks. It's just that we're trying to be very specific. I got a sp- certain amount of people. I am not, I, I, <laughs> I enjoy training, okay? And I really do. And so I, I, the money is not the important thing to me. The important thing is, is I help the people that are paying for it. So don't just show up thinking you can go there and watch. Uh, make sure you get your tickets. Like Dave said, we don't pass out any addresses until you have your ticket. So, ABD, I'm looking forward to seeing you there, partner. That will be great. Uh, let's see here. Um, Mark is watching from Virginia. Uh, 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 Tamar is, uh, man, I always get it wrong. Help me one more time. Uh, Tamar, I cannot remember. Please help me. Uh, Casino, New South Wales, Australia. It's nice and yep. sunny here. Your saddle tack are due to arrive on Monday. Oh, Steve, how do I say it? How do I say it? Tamar? I call it Tamar. I don't All right. know why. All right. There we go. You know, Until she corrects me. I talk me. funny over there, and they talk funny <laughs> over here. So, you know. If you want to say razor blades with an Australian accent, you say rise up lights. Rise up lights. Rise up lights. Uh, Jack is watching. If you find a good farrier, take care of them when they are at your place. Have your animals ready for the visit. Visit. Feed the farrier afterwards or offer. Good chance they'll come back. That's right. Keep your farriers fat and happy. Uh, Linda is watching. Says, I didn't realize I could use the saddle horn to dally. Yep, there you go. Learning something new. Nancy is watching from Wrightsville, Pennsylvania, 70 degrees. Folks, if you've got any questions, now's the time to put them in there. We've got a few minutes left here. Got a question that came in from Cheryl. Cheryl said, uh, what type of uh, what type of cinch do you recommend for a mule? I see you sell a neoprene cinch. What about a mohair cinch? What's a mohair cinch and why do you recommend a neoprene? I don't like mohair cinches because I got so many mules. Uh, I mean, when I was riding a lot of mules, I got cinch rash all the time. Even though I kept it super clean, I tried all kinds of cinches, all kinds of ways. The reason I use that perforated neoprene, listen, folks, it's perforated neoprene. So it's got holes that it breathes through and that creates the sweat. Anything that sets solid against my mule or donkey on the back, perforated neoprene on my saddle pad, not wool. Wool sucks the moisture out, makes it dry. On my cinches, when I have my cinches up there and touching the animal consistently, it's going to be perforated neoprene. It allows the animal to breathe. Why do you want more? Uh, why do you want sweat? You want to use it as a way to keep the animal cool and you want it's a way to keep the animal lubricated. I don't use mohair cinches. I had lots of problems with them over the years. I got lots of clients that do too. Again, folks, I, I developed these products out of what I learned from working, not just riding my lunch up the trail, but as a working cowboy packing freight and things like this. So, that's why I developed. The other thing I developed the, the cinch for, and we're going to get a video so, so that it goes with my cinch stuff, and you all can see, it's got a pad, and it's got a metal ring. Now, if you pull that cinch, because it has elastic in it, if you pull that D-ring past that pad, you over-tightened your cinch. People are always asking me, Dave, how tight do I do the cinch? Well, that's one of the ways that gives you a general idea how to tighten up the cinch on a mule. And so uh, I, that's what I prefer, folks, is, is that I don't like those, those uh, cotton cinches. I don't like the rope cinches. I've had too many problems with cinch rash. 
All right here, moving right along. Uh, Emily sent in a message, says, I'm trying to buy a used saddle for our new mule. I have one in sights, but there's no way I can actually tell if it has mule bars, but the model number. I didn't know if there's another way to tell. It has all the loops, hooks, but I have ran into this before where it has all the hooks, but when you look into it further, the saddle has quarter horse bars. So Steve, um, why do we need... So, we don't sell mule saddles and we don't sell saddles with mule bars. We sell Steve Ad Edwards saddles with Steve Edwards bars. So if anybody ever tries to sell you a mule saddle and say it's the same as a Steve Edwards saddle, it's not. They might not know that that's not the case. Maybe they do know. Let's believe the best. They don't know, but now you know. Unless it's a Steve Edwards saddle, it is not a Steve Edwards saddle. So we do not sell saddles that have mule bars in them. We say it's Steve Edwards saddles because they're designed uniquely to fit the bone structure of the animal, whereas all of these other saddles rely on other measurements and other data points. Now, how do you tell if it's a Steve Edward, if it's got mule bars inside of it? Well, first and foremost, like, it's not a Steve Edwards saddle. But second, on top of that, how, how can you tell, Steve? If, if there's a saddle, they say it's a Steve Edwards saddle, and let's just say that all the logos got burned off. How would they know that it's Steve Edwards bars on the inside? Well, the only way you can really tell is send me a picture and I can look at it. But there should be a plate on the canal and up on the front, uh, uh, the between the pummel and my D-ring on the front cinch, there's a there's a uh, leather keeper for your latigo, your extra latigo to go into, and right there is stamps, uh, and then you'll be able to see on the skirting, like uh, on my trail light saddles on the skirting, it gives the size of the saddle. But that's one way you can tell. The other way is you can tell that I have, unless somebody changes it, and that happens a lot. I have nylon ladder goes all the way around, four of them. I do not have three billets. If it has three billets, that saddle was not designed properly for a mule. What I mean by billet, it's a leather strap. It's about 16, eight, eight inch, 18 inches long. And you have one on the right front, right rear, and left, left rear. Now, the reason they have that is because they don't want to go over the other side and and move the cinch around. They just want to tighten everything up from the left side. The downside of that is, folks, just like I had a lady contact me the other day, her saddle kept slipping. Well, why did it slip? I said, send me a couple of pictures. I'm always going to tell you, send me some pictures. She sent me pictures, and she had the cinches on crooked. Well, when it's crooked, the low side is going to pull that saddle. I mean, the high side is going to pull that saddle to you. So where's always the high side? on the left hand side or the near side so make sure your cinches are centered perfectly centered and you'll do good and don't go buying a saddle other than a steve edwards saddle uh next question here this one is about a mechanical hack hackamore came in from derek uh derek asked the question says uh, for the past seven years i have trail ridden my very large molly mule in a rawhide bozale uh, bozal uh, she is 17. For the first time today on a trail ride, she suddenly wanted to go back to the trailer and really tried to take off with me aboard. Quite a battle to stop her. One, will your mechanical hackamore get me more woe? And two, how do I know the size will fit her? This one's from Derek. Okay, so Derek, hey, congratulations on using a hackamore. The only problem is you used a hackamore too long. Folks, a bozales, which is kind of a... Uh, a teardrop looking uh, hackamore and it can be several sizes all the way from as big around as my little finger to uh, almost an inch around depending on what you're doing and here's the thing the mules are, learn from their nose you build a foundation from the nose and then you quit using the nose and then you go to the mouth that's why I tell you to use the come along rope. It's very much like a bozal. It teaches you to go to the right, the left, stop, and this sort of thing. The thing is, it's just like what, what Derek's just learned here. The mule finally had enough of you 
bumping and pulling on his nose. He finally had enough, okay? I use the Bozales only when I've got meals that are that, are that kind that will do really well in a Bozal, okay? Which is one out of 500, I'm going to say. I rarely use it. So here's the deal. Let's go on. You need to go to, number one, get all the teeth floated and done right. Number two, get my mule riders martingale and start using it consistently out there on a the trail. But notice, and like I tell you with everything else, folks, do your groundwork first. So no more bozal except for building a foundation. No more. The downside of it is it's going to create problems, as you found out. Now, next thing, mechanical hackamore. No, no, no. We don't want, you've already got her spoiled on the nose. So let's don't use a mechanical hackamore and create more problems because mechanical hackamore is a lot of leverage. Now, here's the thing, folks. When you're dealing with the nose on a mule, you must use different parts of the nose as you are progressing in your training. Two fingers above the nostril when you start. The reason that is, <clears throat> is it's a sensitive area and will give you better communication value by using that bozales. Okay. As you progress, you're going to go to a lighter and lighter bozales where it's going to be smaller. And then as you do that, you're going to be using a combination of the bozales and the, and the bridle and eventually out of the bozales and into the bridle. That's the that's the, the progress. How would I fix this problem? I would number one, we're done riding for a while, unless you want to go to ER, because that's where you're going to go. Because you can turn that mule and have its nose clear over against your hip, and they'll still run just as fast sideways as they will straight ahead, especially if you've been using horse techniques by disengaging hind quarters and and uh, and doing lateral flexions. All that stuff right there causes mega problems with your mule. So let's go on. If I was going to start this mule right, I would get my ground communication kit. I would use my come along hitch and I would start getting the mule's nose back where it needs to be lighter. I don't know what size of a bozales you use, but it doesn't make any difference. Folks don't realize that you go from a heavy to a light uh, and, and, and various uh, braids too. But anyway, let's go on. As we're going with this, I would use my, do my ground communication and that's where I would stay. Uh, I would, an, an average of at least 90 days. And it's going to depend now, uh, building a foundation is a full six months training four to six hours a week. That's all four to six hours a week. Now you come along rope, use it every day. Every day, going from A to B, like I told you about in the very first part of the program. That's, that's exclusively this uh, this next weekend <clears throat> when I am uh, up in Superior, Montana. You're going to see me using that come along hitch throughout the whole thing. I'm not even going to bother using a rope halter except to talk about some basics. So we're going to do some videoing with that. Let's go on. So as we progress, we're going to start as the mule starts progressing and doing good we're going to introduce them to the mule riders martingale and there again that's groundwork you get a video with it you get the bridle the bit the reins everything and then you get a sur single and start building a foundation as you progress and as the mule is doing good and getting his nose on a vertical and framed up here's the next thing out comes the rope halter the rope halter now we adjust the rope halter so that the knots are in the nose and we put the rope halter on the mule and we use the rope halter and the mule riders martingale together. We take twine, baling twine, and we tie it back to the sur single and we, we do that loose so that the, the, just the weight of the halter is enough along with the mule riders martingale. Combination of those two. As we progress, and the mule is consistently getting his nose on the vertical as he's consistently dropping and framing himself up. Then we can start taking the halter off and just go to mule riders martingale only. Now, as they progress and they're getting consistent, remember folks, 
you're going to use the thought of asking, telling, demanding, comfortable, uncomfortable, all right? But we also got to use the three, six, nine, twelve. So as the mule is going around in a round pen, every time he comes by the gate, that's one. If he does it correctly. Now, when I say correctly, today he might have his head a little bit on the on the elevation. Might have his nose sticking out a little bit. Okay. It's not perfect the way we want, but our goal to eventually have balanced and framed up, as you'll see the mule in the video. So that's what I would do. Uh, I appreciate you using that bozal, but as you can see, you finally come to a point where the mule had enough. And here's the thing, folks. Always get this in your mind. The mule is telling you all this time how uncomfortable he is, but we don't get it. The main thing is, think about it. When the head is elevated, they're uncomfortable. They hollows out their back and it makes them more uncomfortable and it can get worse. So hopefully I went through a lot of, of information there. But anytime, folks, you have a problem on the trail, get your come long rope out and go back to ground foundation one. Anytime. All right. Uh, let's see. Nancy's watching from Wrightsville, Pennsylvania. Uh, first time watching live. I've been watching for a year and looking forward to meeting you in Tennessee. When you see him, Nancy, go up and say hello. Uh, uh, Tamer, no worries with the pronunciation, but it can be pronounced like a lion tamer. So Tamer, there we go. Tamer Smith. Awesome. Sherman Johnson Tamer. is watching. Had all three of my mules dental work done yesterday. It was a pretty neat learning experience. Did you take pictures? Sherman, that sure would be cool to see. Send those in if you did. Hey, Dave, I sent you some pictures of some caps and stuff. You did? I got them. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. Um, I think we should do something with them here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Linda says, regarding farriers, we live in Amish country. Not that all Amish are good with equines, just like <clears throat> like everyone else, some are good and some aren't. We use knowledgeable. We use a knowledgeable family. Watch for folks who approach a new animal at the shoulder and folks who can give sensible answers about foot and leg structure. That's great. It's great. Just know what questions to ask right there. How do, how are you supposed to approach an equine from the shoulder, right? How are you? Right. So, uh, how is this? How, tell me about the leg structure. Can't answer that. I mean. <laughs> You want them working on it? Uh, let's see here. Miss Backwood says, what age for a mule should I start getting the teeth floated? Well, the pictures that we've got of these caps and stuff, this mule was three years old and should have had them done a long time ago. Actually, it was a donkey uh, that the lady was that sent us the pictures of the caps and had to pull some teeth and things like this. So <clears throat> here's the thing, folks. Mules and donkeys grind their feed they do not chew their feet. So they will start getting sharp points and stuff very young in, in age. Talk to your dentist, your, your veterinarian, who they are, and let them tell you what they feel is correct. There you go. Whoa. Yep. There's a tooth pull and there's two caps. No wonder the donkey was upset. No wonder the donkey, yeah, bucked her off. That's right. Folks, it, this is important. You got to understand, yes, you want to enjoy and go out and ride and enjoy life. Yes, you do. Okay. Yes, you do. You want to go out and enjoy. But make sure your donkey or your mule is comfortable. And you can't do it with a mouth full of teeth that are not right. You're pulling on their mouth. Yeah, it ain't going to work. Even you guys with the Bozells and your mechanical hackamores. You're still creating problems with the mouth. Okay, there you go. Great stuff right there. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Uh, how do I correct a windswept mule? I have never been trying to balance out his feet with trimmings. Right shoulder is slightly larger than left. Teeth are even off. Took him to the vet, got nowhere. Windswept. I've never heard of that term wind. Sounds swept. like a cologne. Yeah. <laughs> Although I don't know if I'd want to wear the wind swept mule cologne. Penny, what yeah. do you mean by wind swept? Help us out yeah, there. I don't know. Uh, Trace says, late to the program this morning, which that means Australia. <laughs> Woo! Hi, Stephen Dave from Lowood, Queensland, Australia, 36.5, a bit chilly. Stay warm. 
Uh, Mark Williams says, good looking cup, Steve. Mark gave me this cup. That's right. Good man. Uh, Tony is watching from Port Angeles, Washington. Sunny and 75. Thanks for your help. Let's see if we can wrap up a few more questions here. Bra uh, Bradley sent in a message, says, I would like to use a vertical rifle with a scope gun case in my front in front of my right leg. Can you make a saddle with the fastening rings or whatever that is used already to hang the case from? Thank you. I talked to Bradley and I talked him out of it. Folks, those carrying your rifle in your, in your scabbard and this sort of thing is one of the biggest mistakes people make. I used to carry it underneath my legs, straight up and down. I carried it in the back. <coughs> I carried a lot of weight. So finally, I'm going to tell you, I carry it across my back. That's how I carry it. Now, I can tell you that I have had guys tell me they got off of their mule to go shoot an elk or a deer and went to rat go for the rifle. It scared the mule. The mule took off, rifle, saddle, and all. And a couple days later, they found parts. So, yeah, Bradley changed his mind. No uh, hanging the saddle uh, with the rifle on the saddle. Not doing that. Good idea. Uh, so we've got uh, one more question. Uh, Trace just sent in um, a clarifier for Penny, so we'll get to that in a second. Last question that I had ahead of time was from Karen. I saw on your site Mule Mountain trail, ride, trail riding bits. I've been riding Amigo with a snaffle and seems to work well. What do you think? What would you say there to Karen, Steve? Well, it'll be like the guy with the, with the Bozell. You know, he did it for set nine years, he said. Well, that's about the longest I've ever heard anybody. Anyway, another story. The, the snaffle bit, folks, is to build a foundation and to fix a problem. It is not the everyday bit to be riding in. It's not. And if you're riding in a smooth snaffle bit, you'll eventually get to the point like uh, the, the Hackamore guy did. He, you, he, the mule decided he's going to go his way. He'll do it because they do not respect a smooth snaffle bit. They don't. They do not respect a hackamore that's been used and used and used on them. It makes them dead in their face. So uh, I would definitely, if you can, here we are. Let me, let's go to this. How do we know when to go from a snaffle bit to the finished bit? The day I can one-handed because the snaffle bit is meant to use direct reining two-handed, okay? When I can one-handed back up on a light touch, one-handed go to the right, one-handed go to the left on a light touch, I'm starting to get to where I can introduce my finished bit, neck reining. Now, notice I did not say add a leg. The problem with adding the leg is it's too much pressure and it's too much information. Use a combination of the leg and the bridle at the same time. You're going to make a stiff mule. You're going to make a very hard to deal with donkey. So always do your ground, your, your ground communication first. Then you go into your snaffle bit. And I do not use a smooth snaffle. I've got a, a double twisted wire snaffle bit that I've been using for years. Uh, it's consistent. Uh, I got the design from an old cowboy that gave me this bit. It is not like any other double twister wire out there. So the Martingale, the, the Mule Riders Martingale fixes the problems of no sticking it out, elevating the head and running through their shoulder and much other things. Hey, there we go. Click the wrong button. All right, here yeah, we go. Uh, Trace says, windswept legs is a term that describes an angular limb deformity in foals. The deformation causes a foal to look as though he is getting blown to one side in the wind. Angular limb deformities are not uncommon, but windswept conformation is. It affects both front legs or both hind legs when it occurs. Uh, Penny chimed in then and said, Trimmer said he is in high low his back of his hoofed left front is rolled in and back hooves are both rolled in where he's putting too much pressure on his foot and it's rolling in 
and his shoulder was higher on one side. His jaw is slightly cocked to one side, so his teeth are not balanced. You can open his front teeth, see they are jacked to one side, not sure how to correct this. And then, of course, her original question was, how do I correct a windswept mule? I've been trying to balance out his feet with trimming right shoulder, slightly larger than our left teeth are off. That's a lot of work, Steve. Is this is yeah, this possible? I'm, I'm not familiar with it all. I can't. I can't even begin to address that. Uh, you know, find yourself a good farrier, find yourself a good veterinarian, and see what happens. It might be that the animal just could be a a lawn ornament. I don't know, but but best to you on that, and, and let us know how you do with that. I'd be I'd be very interested, so we could share that with other people. Okay, did I not say that earlier in this broadcast that Plenty of times. I'm like, I called it. I called it. I said plenty of times. If you watch with regularity, you're going to hear Steve Edwards say something to the effect of, gosh, Dave, I, I've never heard of that. Uh, that's the first time I'm hearing of this. or, or uh, I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, so I really don't know how to answer that. I sure do wish uh, that you would get back to me, though, and let me know what you find out so that I can learn it and I can help other. Did I not... Linda, you were watching. You saw it. Who was the first person? I called it. Uh, Cowboy Ken, you saw it. Polly saw it. Barbara saw it. Linda, Randy, Stacy, David Pagelli, you all saw it. I called it. Ah, I feel so good. Uh, let's see go. here. Marsha is watching from Shenandoah uh, County, Virginia. Uh, Linda says, such an interesting conversation tonight. Thank you, everyone. Yes, it was an interesting conversation. We went a little long, uh, but that's it. We got through everything today. Polly says, I heard you. That's right. Yes, Dave, you called it. Oh, I get one right every now and again. Steve, thanks so much for hanging out. Is there anything you want to say before we're all done here? No. Hey, folks, I'm looking forward to seeing you all in Superior, Montana. Uh, this next week, Susan and I are leaving Sunday. And uh, we're going to get up there and, and, and enjoy. Now, they tell me it's been hot up there. Uh, so it'd be kind of interesting to see how the weather is going to be. Because it sure has been nice here. But happy trails. We'll hey, see y'all. y'all, if you want cool weather there, y'all be praying for cool weather in Montana. God is a God that answers prayers. He hears his people. Uh, you might not uh, hear him back right away. But he hears you. And his word is true. And uh and you know what? You can bother him with something like, I would just like some good weather. He is not too busy off running the cosmos. He is personal. He knows every hair on your head. And uh, and he is anxious to hear from you and anxious to love on you. Uh, all right, that was it. You just said hoping for good weather. It ain't, it ain't a bad thing to ask Jesus for good weather, is it, Steve? No. Any and all things. All right, blessings to you. All right, thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.